not able to, uh, to be here with us this morning, and uh, we want to be sure to make sure we reach out to them and, and uh, pray for them, remember them in our prayers. It's a wonderful morning uh, to, to come together and worship God. Uh, it's, it's felt pretty nice weather-wise the past two days. Uh, so we're, we're blessed to be here this morning, and uh, I hope uh, you feel the same way. Uh, Paige wanted me to announce that to all the ladies who can and are willing to stay, uh, they're going to get the visitors bags together after services today. It shouldn't take long, I think, so if you'd like to help with that, uh, please do that. Uh, hope you have your Bibles. Uh, we're going to look at several different passages this morning as we go through our study. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks ago now, maybe even two months, uh, we went to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and the very top part of Kentucky, uh, had a couple of us go, and, and uh, we went and watched, uh, the Braves were actually playing the Cincinnati Reds, and got to watch that, uh, uh, that game one night, got up the next day, and, and went and uh, toured the Ark Encounter, and uh, also, got rear-ended while we were in Cincinnati, so that was part of, you know, the festivities and everything, so we uh, had good fun with that, too. <laughs> but uh, I tell you what, if you've never been to the Ark Encounter, I would encourage you to try to find the time and go. You know, we hear about the story of Noah building the arcs from the time that we're, I mean, just itty-bitty, you know, and we sing songs about it, and, and it, it kind of helps put things into perspective when you're able to go and see how massive this thing is. I mean, when you walk, when you first pull up and you get out, you can see it. It looks big, but when you walk up under uh, the Ark Encounter there, it just, it's amazing to see how huge this thing is. Uh, and, and I think it kind of helps put it into perspective when you think about Noah building this thing I was going to say by himself. He had his sons and no doubt had God on his side helping him, helping him with that. But it's, it's an amazing thing. We're actually going to be uh, taking our middle school uh, the seventh grade this year uh, in just a couple months, actually. We're, we're going on a trip. And so I get to go back. And so I'm excited uh, at TCPS. So, uh, but as you go through this Ark Encounter, there's literally three different levels uh, uh, the whole way, and, and it's just got display after display, exhibit after exhibit, and it's got all of this information with Bible verses written out right beside it. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's really awesome. And uh, they, they have all these different things that are just so interesting to see. Uh, and one of those things that we came across was uh, an exhibit uh, about doors. And you might be like, what? world are you talking about? Why would you want to look at an exhibit that, that's all about talking about some doors, right? Well, specifically, uh, the uh, display talks about the different doors and the representation of those doors or entryways that we find throughout the Bible. And Paige and I spent some time looking at it. They had some pamphlets uh, handed out uh, to go along with it. And it's actually a very interesting uh I was going to say concept, but it, it, it's something that we find straight out of Scripture. And so I thought it would be an interesting study for us tomorrow morning to go through and actually look at, at the different kind of doors we see throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, leading up to the New Testament, seeing what exactly these different doors represented uh, in that specific moment in history as we read about it in the Bible. It's really cool that... Uh, that the, the different doors we're going to discuss the, that are mentioned, how they highlight the different aspects of, of God's love and, and mercy and judgment and so many other things. So we're going to look at that this morning and I, I ask if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and get those out and let's turn to uh, Genesis chapter 6. Obviously, speaking about the ark, where do you think we're going to start? We, one of the first times we see this uh, in Scripture he is right there with Noah building the ark. You remember at the time, uh, it had the world had become so evil that God said the uh, hearts of men on the face of the planet were literally evil continu continually. Their hearts and their thoughts were evil continually. God 
said that he literally repented that he had even created the world and mankind. That's how bad it had gotten. But, Genesis 6, 8, what happened? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know how blessed we are today that Noah decided to be righteous? I mean, honestly, if, if not for Noah and his family being righteous, where would we be right now? Probably not here, right? But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah had it in his heart that he was to abide by the will of God, unlike any other. Now, you know, we talk about how hard it is today, right? And we complain sometimes. We complain about how hard it is to be a Christian in this day and age. Think about Noah. Noah and, and his family, eight individuals, the only ones. I mean, and, and you think of the just destruction and the, uh, the, the sin, the evil that was on the face of the planet that they had to deal with. But hey, they were faithful. They were faithful <laughs> to God. Notice what Genesis chapter 6 and verses 15 and 17 says. This is how you were to make it. God has told Noah, hey, you know, you're going to build an ark because I'm going to destroy the world because of the evil that is in the world. And he says, this is how you are going to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. There we go, the first door that we're going to talk about. Set the door of the ark in its side. And it's, it's amazing uh, obviously, the ark encounter, the fire marshals would go crazy if they would only put one uh, door on the encounter there, right? But God told Noah, Noah, you put one door, the door, on its side. And he goes on, he says, make it lower second and third decks for, uh, decks for behold, I will uh, bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. And which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Man. We see the judgment of God. And so what is so special about this one door of the ark? Well, Genesis chapter 7 verse 1. Uh, the Lord said to Noah, now you go into the ark, you and all your household. For I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Who was able to enter through the door and get on the ark? Well, no one his family. Who else? That's it. Why? Well, he just told us in Genesis chapter 7 verse 1, because Noah was found to be righteous before God in that generation. And a minute ago, we talked about how, how crazy that must have been. Can you imagine being one of eight souls who were righteous before God with the millions of other people acting the way they do? Completely evil. The door to Noah's Ark is the first door that is mentioned uh, in the, the display and the one that we'll mention here this morning. God had instructed, obviously, Noah to build this ark to save his family, right? Not only that, but for the animals as well. And so he flooded the earth to wipe out an exceedingly evil world. Now notice what it says in verses 15 and 16 of Genesis chapter 7. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. And what did he do? What did the Lord do with the, the door? The Lord shut him in, right? It wasn't up to Noah to shut that one door, right? God was the one. Now, now all on the face of the planet, they had the opportunity, right? The opportunity was there. They, they had that opportunity to be righteous unto God, and if they would have so chosen to do so, guess what? They would have been right there with Noah. Who knows if, if more people had uh, chosen to obey God in that time, taking that opportunity to be righteous, they might not have been in this situation in the first place. This door that we read about uh, of the ark symbolizes God's justice, symbolizes his mercy, obviously, for Noah and his family, as he's the one that shut them in. But him shutting them in also did what for everyone else? 
shut them out, right? That judgment was brought upon them. And it's amazing that, uh, that we can see the, 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 uh, how it symbolizes that there was only one way. One way to be saved from the physical consequences of the, fl uh, of the flood. And, and it's awesome to also think about how this one representation kind of foreshadows. And, and I want to, I kind of want to focus on the, the doors that we talk about this morning uh, along with the art. It foreshadows as uh, it was read, uh, I think Corey read our uh, uh, scripture this morning. Where Jesus says what? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And we're going to get that, uh, get there in just a little bit. But it's amazing to see how these doors, even in the Old Testament, as far back as Noah and the ark, the one door, God shutting them in, the, uh, that being the only entry into their salvation that God had made for them. It foreshadows there only being one way today to be able to enter into heaven. And that being Jesus Christ, the door of the ark. The next door we're going to look at is in Exodus chapter 12. Why don't you turn with me to Exodus chapter 12 now. Exodus chapter 12. Look at down in verses 7 through 13. Now, uh, if you might remember what's going on here. What do, we, what do we read about with Exodus, right? The exit, right, of the Israelites uh, from... Pharaoh's command from the Egyptian bondage they were, that they were in. Most of us probably have read this multiple times. And, and, and you remember that the, uh, they were literally being tortured. They were uh, being tormented. They were slaves, right? They were in bondage to the Egyptian people. And they were God's people. So God does what for Moses? Tells Moses, hey, you go and you get my people out of there. Well, was it that simple? We know it wasn't. We know that God ended up sending uh, these uh, different plagues. And eventually, Pharaoh, after the final plague, allowed them to leave. Now, you'll see in uh, Exodus chapter 12, this is where we're at, right? Exodus chapter 12, verses 7 through 13. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the uh, two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. Uh, they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head uh, with its legs and uh, its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with the belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So shall you eat it in haste. <coughs> Excuse me, it is the Lord's Passover. And now here we understand uh, that we have the institution of the Passover, right? Well, what was the significance? What was the main point? Well, they had to put the blood of this lamb, the spotless lamb, where? About the door. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it, right? What was that supposed to do? He goes on, he says in verse 12, here we see, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the for, uh, firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute. And here it is again that we see judgment being executed by God. And this representation of this door that we're talking about. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Verse 13 says, The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And guess what? It happened. It happened just as God had said it would. All of the firstborn children of the Egyptians, I think later on it says there was not a house there that did not wake up to some death. That judgment was executed by God. But there was a door. There was a door, right? And 
it's amazing to see the foreshadowing here as well, where the blood of a lamb that they were supposed to sacrifice and kill and eat and, and put that blood on the door is what kept them from being killed like the Egyptians. That door signified God's protection for the Israelites. It foreshadowed the need to be covered by the blood of a perfect lamb. And it's, it's an amazing thing to see this. See, the Lord's judgment was coming. But see, all, the, all who had their doors covered by the Lamb's blood would be spared from the plague of the firstborn. I want you to see now and look over in uh, 1 Peter. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. It's the same thing that has happened for us with Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 21 says, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deed, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as gold or silver, uh, silver but with what? With the precious blood of Christ. Guess what he says here? Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him up uh, from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. See, we need that precious blood of Jesus Christ, just like that of a lamb without blemish or without spot. Number two there that we see is the door of the Passover. Uh, number three that we're going to look at this morning can be found in 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6. Turn with me there. This one is uh, interesting as well. Now obviously going through history we, we get on and uh, <coughs> The Israelite people, the Israelite nation had grown and grown and grown and had prospered. Uh, and, and so uh, eventually, what did they want? Well, they wanted a king. And we get to 1 Kings chapter 6 and uh, verses 31 through 35. And we see another example here in which the Israelites had to do. So in verse 31 it says, For the entrance of the inner sanctuary he made doors of olive wood. The lintel and door, per, door posts were one fifth of the wall. The two doors were of olive wood, and he carved on them figures of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, and overlaid them with gold, and he spread gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. So for the door of the sanctuary, he also made door posts of olive wood, one fourth of the wall, and the two doors were of cypress wood. Two panels comprised one folding door. And two panels comprised the other folding door. Then he carved cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers on them, and overlaid them with gold applied evenly on the carved work. And so, what was the uh, what was going on? Well, obviously, we have the door of the temple. See, the uh, this door was the door to the holy of holies, right? And if you remember, King Solomon was instructed to build the temple to to be the place where God would dwell among the Israelite people. And so it was it was something that was to be uh, very uh, revered, right? Very respected. Uh, the only ones who could go in were who? Well, the high priest, right? The only one to go in uh, and to make the, the, uh, the sacrifice for all the people, for the sin of all the people, was the high priest. He was the only one that could pass through because he was the he was to uh, go through all of these different uh, uh, things that he had to uh, to be found pure before God. So God is holy. We're sinful. Sinful man can't be in His presence, and the door represents our separation from Him. Only the the ceremonial uh, pure high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies. Once a year, the door was opened for the high priest to make atonement for the sins of the people. And so again, we see the door of the temple. 
We think about how that foreshadows to what we have in Jesus Christ today. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 19 through 22. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, wait a second, why can we enter the holy places? We have confidence to do that by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest, the great high priest, over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. It's amazing to see the foreshadowing. And then we get to the New Testament. The next door we're going to look at can be found in John chapter 10. Turn with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. All of these doors that we look at represents God's mercy his, his judgment upon those who have not been righteous. And they are all connected to Jesus Christ in some way. And then we get to the New Testament, right? Which, of course, who do we read about? Jesus Christ. John chapter 10, verses 7 through 11 says, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the what? What does Jesus say? call himself? How, how does Jesus refer to himself here? I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Man, how blessed we are. Because you see, Jesus being the door for his sheep, that's the only way. Again, uh, Corey read for us just a moment ago in uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Guess what he says? No one, no one comes to the Father except through who? Jesus Christ. The only way we can get to heaven, the only way that we can get to our Father who is in heaven is through Jesus Christ and through obeying His will. See, so the door represents how Jesus is our only way to even have a relationship with the God of heaven. Shepherds in Israel, the uh, rest of the Middle East at that time, uh, they rested in the opening to the, to the sheepfold. That way that uh, the sheep could uh, come and go through the door, right? So Jesus, the, the good shepherd, our door to eternal life. He is the way, the entryway that we have to be able to be in heaven with God one day. And he lays down his life for us. And that's so important that he did that. And with that, we see the cross. See, each of the doors that we've talked about provide different aspects of the good news, right? The good news of Jesus Christ, the fact that he came and, and died for us, died on the cross for us, sacrificed as a spotless lamb without blemish. He was perfect. He was the only way, right? Without Jesus, there would be no door for us to get to heaven, right? We understand that. We talk about having no hope without Jesus Christ. That's the idea. There would be no way. We couldn't enter. It would be impossible. But because Jesus was perfect, because he was spotless, and because he died, Gave his life as the good shepherd. Gave his life for the sheep. We have that way. And we see his death on the cross. The next uh, door after that that is very important to us. Matthew chapter 28. Y'all look with me in Matthew chapter 28.
resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't think in my 20 something years, I don't think we've studied a passage like that at, at Maywood Christian Camp. Man, it, it, it really opens your eyes to how important. You know, we talk about all the time the death of Jesus, right? And, and, and we focus on that. And, and obviously, that is very important, but it goes hand in hand with the fact that the stone was rolled away and Jesus rose. Because he, he, rising from that death, defeated Satan. That, that is when Satan was defeated. That is when it is seen that, that no one, Satan himself, has no power over Jesus Christ and over God our Father in heaven. And with his resurrection, we have hope. That stone was rolled away. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6 says, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he had loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, without his resurrection, we don't have our resurrection. Our hope is not there. This is the hope that we all have as Christians, that hope of eternal life to be with Him one day. So blessed that we are able to access the door of our shepherd, that we have the shepherd's door accessible to us today. And so the question uh, that we might ask now is, have you accessed that door? Have you decided to obey Jesus Christ in your life so that through Jesus you can have a relationship with our God and Father in heaven? If you can't answer that question, we need to talk. We need to study this morning. We don't need to wait. We don't need to put it off. If you're here this morning and, and you're not a Christian, we need to study God's Word together. That can happen, and we can assist you with that this morning. Maybe uh, maybe you are a Christian, and see, if we're not careful, we let our focus go, what happens? Well, we can be separated from God, right? Because of our sin, allowing our sin uh, to, to remain without repentance, without the right attitude behind it, it can separate us from the God of heaven and we can be lost again. Last door I want to look at, maybe even a gate, door gate, very similar, Matthew chapter 7. Probably a familiar passage to most of you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, though, says, Enter by the narrow gate, right? The narrow door, the door of Jesus Christ. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to where? Destruction. And there are so many, it says, those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, the way is hard, that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Are few. Again, we saw the same thing with Noah. With Noah and the ark, right? I mean, if you use that as an example here, kind of, kind of foreshadowing to what we're going to have, Noah and his family, eight individuals, man, the way is hard. It is. And the door is narrow. But see, we can enter through that. I hope we'll do that. God has blessed us in so many ways, and there is truly good news that can be found in Jesus Christ. And I hope that we'll all take the opportunity to make sure that our life is right, make sure that we are going to be able to enter into heaven one day through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you for your time uh, this morning. If you have any need, you're sub in, uh, subject to the invitation, the Lord's invitation that's always open. You're subject at this time, though. Won't you come as we stand, as we sing the song?
That's a lot different from up here. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Uh, I've got two scriptures that I want to bring out here. Matthew 27, 24 through 31. And uh, the next one is 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 30. Uh, and at this time, we should be mindful of the hope of Christ, Christ, Christ paid on the cross and try to think on the correct way to take the communion. And I've got the scriptures to go along here. Uh, Matthew 27, 24 to 31 says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then released he bought Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on a scarlet robe. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put on his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And then later on, you know, this was only just a little bit of what he suffered, but for them to spit on him and ridicule him, you know, and then the people uh, before that had said uh, that the blood be on us and our children, I'm thinking that they thought that Christ was going to be a earthly king and they still wouldn't wouldn't accept him. But they thought in their mind they were doing the right thing but they wouldn't. And Jesus went on and suffered uh, death on the cross. And of course he rose the third day for our sin. And we should be remembering that at this time. And over in 1 Corinthians 11, 24-30 says, And when Jesus, or when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of 
say, Father, just thank you for this day. Thank you for all the things you've us with. Just please bless this bread and what it represents. For we know that it represents Christ's body that was beaten and battered and broken on that poor cross of Calvary. And please help us take of it and know that it will be well-pleasing in my sight. In the name. Amen. <coughs> Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we're also commanded to give for the first day of the week. You would please bow with me. Our God and Father in heaven, we're so thankful for all the blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day, Lord. We ask that we'll be mindful of the things that you give us, and we know all things come from you, and that we will give back a portion of that to you cheerfully, not grudgingly, that we will be able to help spread the word of the kingdom and to do your work on this earth. Help us remember that we are your hands and feet, and that we are to go about doing good. Help us to get back to you so the congregation here at Skyline can go about doing good to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
just thankful for the day given us. Thank you for the blessings you've given us. Father, we're just thankful that we were here, be able to come here and worship you, Father. Father, just please be with the teachers as they're, we're about to go to classes, Father. And Father, we just love you so much. We thank you. And please bring us back to the next point in time. In your name I pray. Amen.